FAMU versus Southern was an entertaining game. It was a tense game. But most importantly, it was an important game. While I have three adjectives to break it down, I have four takeaways from the matchup. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On family, welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU podcast, your number one daily one stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, aka the mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S, ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use the promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. We have a stacked episode. We wrap up today's episode discussing Howard and what they showed while they kept it close against FBS competition over the weekend. Then we have the Wild Wild West, in other words, the Swack West, where we have so many teams who are battling it out already. It seems like it's going to be a jumbled but very entertaining mess. But speaking of entertaining, you had FAMU versus Southern. And yes, I could go through the adjectives that I gave at the beginning of the show, and they're all important. But I think maybe overall, the biggest thing to look at are the four takeaways from this SWAC battle. You have the top dog in the SWAC East against, record-wise, the top dog in the SWAC West, or one of the two who were undefeated. So somebody's O had to go, as they like to say. But let's look at the four takeaways. Number one, the first takeaway that I wanted to have is that Mumford Stadium picked absolutely the perfect time to cut the lights. Now, I don't know if you were able to see this. I ain't got no shame about what's on my Twitter. So you can go through my likes at South Exclusive, right? And I've seen this moment where they didn't show it on television. I didn't see it on TV, at least, where they had Southern and they had FAMU on each hash looking at each other and they killed the lights. I don't know how they got this moment together. I don't know how early the players knew this was going to happen. I'm sure Southern knew coming in, hey, if this is a close game, we're going to do this. I thought that was absolutely perfect. I would love to see that become a part of tradition in many places. Or maybe that's just a Mumford Stadium thing. Maybe that's one of the things that makes Southern special is that that's what they do in big time moments. You bring each other, not to the 50 like it's a coin toss, but each of you are standing here on the hash and we're just yelling at each other because that's the type of game that it was. It was one of those games where we're already playing beyond the whistle. We're already getting personal fouls. We're already tense. We're already chippy. So when you're yelling at each other, this isn't manufactured. This isn't, oh, the lights kicked off. Let's do something. This is, we probably were already doing this. Now you just put us in a moment where we could be sanctioned to do it. You know, it wasn't much order. That's what Willie Simmons said. But I thought it was great. And it really made the moment feel like a moment and not just, okay, the fourth quarter is about to happen, right? And I think this might have been the first time that they did it because a a Baton Rouge uh, reporter is actually the person who said instead it's the first time he had ever seen it. So I'm going to assume that the stadium hadn't done this before, but please keep bringing it back. Right. And they were they were spaced out enough to where this wasn't risky. Like they weren't that close. It would have the coaches had it all together. But I thought that this was a good moment. My second takeaway is Jeremy Musa is a good quarterback. I think that Musa is a victim of context or hype, rather, in this situation. So I watch what he does. I watch the game, and I, I wanted to see the criticism because, you know, I, I watched the FAMU versus Jackson State game, and I felt as if he wasn't on point in that game, but he'll get it together. 
but the criticisms about the lack of consistency have continued. So I want to sit down for myself with a real designated eye and look for what I was, you know, look for the inconsistencies. And I saw them. But here's the thing. He's a good quarterback. He's not a great quarterback. But he is a preseason SWAC Offensive Player of the Year. When you hear that, you're expecting great. He's the quarterback for the top team in the SWAC in a championship caliber squad. He's not great, but you would want him to be that. So when you're looking for certain things, there's so many teams that will take a Jeremy Musa. I'll be honest with you. There are so many teams that will take a Jeremy Musa. And it's a lot worse. You could be worse than Jeremy Musa and still be good. That's how good Jeremy Musa is. He just might not be great because you see the open receivers. And it's like, I even seen Coach Willie Simmons. He told me he's wide blinking open. So, like, I get the frustration. I understand why people would be mad. But you also see him make plays. You got to take the good with the bad. You know, and I know the bad can be frustrating. The bad is what lingers in your mind. It's what sticks out more so than anything else. But at the end of the day, when I watch him play, the idea that Musa should be benched to me is not something that I agree with. You know, they're coming out of a, a bye week after this week. If they decide to move on from Musa, I don't know if I could support the decision. They know the guys in the in the locker room more than I do. Maybe they have a quarterback who they feel can do something more than this. But for me, yes, he's missed a couple of receivers. I don't know if that's going to balance out because it just seems to be too ongoing. But he's also made a lot of pinpoint plays. It's not just, oh, the guy's open. Let's throw it to him. I've seen Musa throw guys open. I've seen Musa make impressive throws. So he's a good quarterback. But because he's not great, I think oftentimes, or better yet, Musa is a good quarterback. But because he's probably not as good as people might hope he should be because of the context of him being a preseason offensive player of the year, maybe because of the team he plays for and simple fact that that's a championship team. So maybe they want him to be on a level 10 because he's not as good or as great as they might want him to be. I think a lot of times people make him out to be worse than he actually is. But let's move into Southern improving because that's my third takeaway. I know they didn't have a great game, but this is a great defense that FAMU has. And I felt like their offense, Southern's offense, did a couple of things that, you know what, inspired me. Gary Quarles, his ability to run, that dynamic running attack that he showed. It was really just him, but his dynamic ability. It gave me a little glimmer of hope. It wasn't one I was like, oh, everybody's going to see it, but I saw some things. I saw some things coming together. I saw Harold Blood throw some balls down the field. I saw August Pete uh, catch a, a phenomenal pass and look like he almost lost the guy late in the game. I saw these aspects of the game, and it made me feel a tad bit more hopeful for exactly what to look for going forward with Southern. Now, because I have criticized that offense heavily as the season's going on. And then my last thing is Dooley. That was terrible clock management. People talk about play calling at the end of the game, and he ran the ball two times in that last drive, in which he had two and a half minutes, 237, I think, to be exact. My problem with the first one wasn't the fact that he ran the ball because, you know, it's, it's first down. You got two and a half minutes left. You can run the ball in that situation. You're probably hoping to catch fam you off guard because everybody thinks you're going to pass. You're thinking, OK, I can run. Maybe I can get a 10 yard game, kick off this drive. I get it. I don't know if I love the call, but I definitely get the process, the thought process behind it. But my problem is it took you 25 seconds in between the play ending for you to start the next one. You didn't snap the ball 25, nearly 25 seconds after that play ended. That's the issue. The sense of urgency that just was completely absent in this drive. Because the next time you run the ball, now that was egregious because you have barely over a minute left. You end up taking 17 seconds to snap the ball. Then you get sacked on the next play. So now you call your timeout because you didn't call a timeout after either one of those run plays. The second one was bad because now you're below a minute. So now you take 17 seconds, you get snapped or you get sacked. And now you have 34 seconds left on the clock for the rest of the game. You need a touchdown and you haven't even crossed the 50. So as much as people want to talk about the run plays and that's part of it, that definitely plays a part. Don't get me wrong. And I heard what Dooley said about how they were giving him certain things. I don't think I really agree with that. I, I didn't like the play call personally. But put all of that to the side. If you're going to run the ball, 
get up to the line, snap a play. There's no reason that you should be taking 25 seconds, 17 seconds to snap the ball. That's egregious. I don't care what play you decide to call. If you're going to run, you need to move it fast. That's how I look at it. So those are my four biggest takeaways is that one, hey, Mumford Stadium, kudos to you because that was a great moment in tone setting. By the way, Southern did end up scoring a touchdown on the drive right after that that started off the fourth quarter. Jerry Moose is a good but not great quarterback. I thought that Southern's improving on offense a little bit. Gave me a little bit of hope that they could do more. But then lastly, Dooley, that was a bad play call. That was bad time management. That was just a bad handling of the final drive. You didn't get far enough and you didn't have any urgency within that. As we move forward, though, let's look at the ramifications of the imp or the, the outcome of this game. Because like I said, it's an impactful game. And that's because of what it did to the SWAC West. And we'll look at what we call the Wild Wild West as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. And we have a new one in the tuck for you. We have Prize Picks. And it's very simple. Listen, you can pick the over, you can pick the under on two to six players. You don't have to go through and know everything about the game. Let's just say you have Justin Jefferson, right? He's coming off of a little bit of a down game. He had an injury at the end of the game. Do you think he's going to go over or under 100 yards this upcoming matchup? He's went over more times than he hasn't this year. Let's see, Alvin Kamara's back. You think he's going to go over or under the projected rushing total? It's that simple. Go to Prize Picks. I love Prize Picks because they also offer weekly promotions that can lead to big time. Payouts is a very simple thing. Go to prizepicks.com. That is prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use the code locked on college and your first deposit will be matched up to a hundred dollars. You know how we do it here. We're always trying to make sure that you can get some money back. They're going to match your deposit. And maybe the best thing about them is that if somebody gets injured pro game, and this is football only so far, but pro collegiate, It'll be rebooted. It's like it never happened because a guy getting injured, you can't do anything about that. But one thing you can do is go to fan or excuse me, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. That is prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. And the Game Time app is the best place for your last minute tickets. Now, if I was, I am going to the Saints Texans game this weekend. So if you see me out there, you're in Houston, holla at me. But if I wanted to wait to the to the end, I could definitely go to game time. Wouldn't miss much. Now, game time is so confident in their prices that they're saying if you find a seat in the same section in the same row as them with a better price, they will pay you back 110 percent on the difference. They're confident they can't be topped. And if they can, they're willing to pay for it. It's really that simple. So go to or game time the app download the app create an account use the code locked on college and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase it's the best place for last minute ticket deals it's the one time procrastination will not kill so download the game time app look for something in your area and use the code locked on college to get twenty dollars off your first purchase As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. And remember, on Friday, we have our live college football kickoff. We've dropped it down to two hours, condensed it so you can get the most information about the biggest games, but not in two hours, just in one. So it's quicker on you. If you can't catch it live, that's fine. Just go ahead and go to the Locked on HBCU YouTube page or go to the podcast page and it'll be there even after the fact. But right now, let's take a look at the wild, wild west because the SWAC West is going exactly how we projected it to be. And by we, I really mean me, but, <laughs> but I think a lot of people are shared in that thought process. When you look at the SWAC East, and I think this is something that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail on tomorrow's episode, but you know who the class of that division is. And it's not many people. It's really two to three. It's really two to three. But at the same time, you look at the West and the West four teams. I said at the beginning of the year, I felt like the SWAC West would have three to four teams fighting it out in the last couple of weeks of the season on who was going to be the champion and represent the division in the conference championship game. 
it's a little early to say that I'm right. It's a little early to, to you know, pat my back and puff my chest out and all of that. It's a little early for that because we're only, what, in week seven, going into week seven now? But it does look like it's on the way to being the case. It does feel like it's on the way to being the case. Now, of course, you have Texas Southern in the mix. You have UAPB in the mix, or excuse me, in the division. Both of those teams are just in the division. But I wouldn't quite say that they're in the mix for this top spot. After Southern lost, it was kind of a hard reset where everybody is back even, but those two teams hung back. Those two teams have two losses and have yet to win a conference game. Of course, anything can happen, but I'm not putting my faith in the turnaround of the Golden Lions or the Tigers. But what I can say is that Prairie View, Grambling, Alcorn, and Southern are the teams in this SWAC West that are going to make up the squads that are fighting it out. And the beautiful thing about it is that they've all lost one game. They're all pretty much even. And three of them have already played each other. Southern is the only school in the SWAC West that actually controls their own destiny. Yes, I understand what just happened with FAMU, and we're coming off of a loss, so it feels weird to champion that. But Southern, out of PV, Alcorn, and Grambling, and then, of course, the Jaguars themselves, Southern is the only team that controls their own destiny. PV, Grambling, and Alcorn all played each other, and they all beat each other. PV beat Alcorn, Alcorn beat Grambling, Grambling, Grambling beat PV. So that whole three-way tie stuff, I'm not going through that right now. But none of them have played Southern. And Southern finishes their season with Grambling at the end, of course, Alcorn and Prairie View. You have a chance to run through your three biggest competitors to end the season on a hot streak and meet whoever is coming out of the SWAC East. No other team has that ability. Now, of course, they could just because here's the thing. PV could win out and Alcorn, excuse me, PV could win out and Grambling could win out. And now PV loses. They don't control their own destiny. Grambling could win out and Alcorn could win out. They don't control their own destiny. Southern, if they went out, they won the SWAC West. Point blank period, right? So this is something that's just really interesting to me. But at the same time, for, for me, what I need out of Southern is I need them to show that they can beat a good team. So we can sit here and talk about Southern controlling their own destiny, but I need them to see or show me I need Southern to show me that they can beat a quality opponent in this conference. They played Alabama State. They lost that game. They played Jackson State. They lost those games. But at the same time, they didn't count towards your SWAC total. So it's okay, whatever. But you did lose to those two games or lose to those two teams within the conference. So if I need Southern, who controls their own destiny, to show something to me, that's because Southern has lost to Alabama State. They've lost to Jackson State. They lost to FAMU. The only teams that they've beaten in this conference is UAPB, and they beat Alabama A&M. And to me, they've lost to three teams that were legitimate championship contenders, and they beat two teams that were not. Meanwhile, you're going to have to run through Prairie View, Alcorn, and Grambling, all of which are championship contenders. So when it comes down to it, which Southern are we going to see? That's the question for a team that controls their own destiny. What team is going to show up? If that team that played FAMU shows up, I think they win more games than they lose going throughout the rest of the season. I know they lost to FAMU, but that's because FAMU is the best team in the SWAC. If they can show up like that on most weeks, I think the offense will be better. I thought the defense had some good moments. Of course, I mean, I thought they played pretty well, right? I'm not going to say they were dominant or anything, but they played pretty well. I can't wait. The West is wild. The West is wild, and I can't wait to see what comes out of it. But as we move forward, let's shift over to the MEAC because Howard put on a pretty good show, and they stayed with yet another FBS opponent. And this isn't the first time that they've done it this year, and that really does credit Larry Scott, the head coach. And we'll look at that as we continue and wrap up today's episode of Locked on HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical, and there's no reason to be caught lacking. Listen, it's very simple. If you know there's a possibility of something to happen, get the Jace case. Five potential life-saving antibiotics. No need to wait until something happens. And when I say if you know something could happen, that's everybody. 
every something could happen to everybody. So make sure that you're just being proactive rather than being reactive. And that means going to get yourself a Jace case. You have to fill out a form. You might talk to a licensed physician. And then also from time to time to make sure that everything's up to date, you'll continue talking to that licensed physician. It's very very simple, right? So when you look at Jace Medical, go to jacemedical.com slash locked on, or excuse me, use the code locked on to get $20 off at purchase. That is Jace Medical, J-A-S-E medical.com. Use the promo code locked on because you never know what could go wrong. So make sure you're prepared for whatever. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. And Howard kept it really close against Northwestern. And this is an FBS competition against an FCS or excuse me, an FCS opponent going against F FBS competition. Right. So you're taking that step up. And, you know, I'm not really a big fan of the moral victory. I don't mind speaking on it, but what I don't like to do is to continuously speak on it. So you won't hear me talk about it a lot of times. Oh, well, they look like this and they look like that. Plus, they ain't been the best record. They ain't, ain't really been going that well this year. So the few times I've talk, talked about it, FAMU versus USF, um, Morgan State versus, was it Townsend? I think it was. No, it wasn't Townsend because Townsend just beat them. But uh, I think it might have been Albany, something like that, the second game of the year. Um, you're looking at now this game. I even speak about it when Howard played against Eastern Michigan. But they performed well in that game. I think they performed well in this game. And one of the things that points to is Larry Scott. Because let's be real. When you enter this game, you know who's supposed to win. And I know we, we know who is supposed to win. Northwestern is supposed to beat Howard. Not only is this a F FCS team, you're a power five team. There's essentially two steps. I know we only look at it being one, but you have FCS. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You have FCS. Then you have group of five. Then you have power five. And these are two completely separate things, even though the group of five and power five are both in the FBS um, subdivision, right? So let's just be clear about it. Nobody's expecting you to win this game. Northwestern has their issues. I read the article. I read the article just to see how Northwestern was feeling about this. And they felt as if some of their offensive line issues were going to be fixed. This was going to be a time to get your mojo back. This was going to be a bounce back game. But it wasn't. Instead, Howard sacked them four times. And I thought they had a really good plan when you look at, I think, three of the four sacks, at least. I can't remember the fourth one right now. But three of the four sacks that I can remember all came off of really good blitzes. So that there was one at the end of the game on fourth fourth quarter, in the fourth quarter on the fourth, on the fourth down, in which they had a slot blitz. And it was just perfectly dialed up. And that's the reason that Northwestern was still at 23 points. And they end up only being a three-point loss. You had a chance where you're thinking, maybe I might be able to come back. But that sack to keep them at 23 was important, right? You had dialed up blitzes on other ones. But the point is, they thought certain things was going to be fixed, and they weren't. So that's a kudos to Howard. You threw a wrench in the plan of Northwestern fans, right? But maybe the guy over everything, because we can credit the defensive coordinator for how they called those blitzes. We can credit Larry Scott for the mentality that he's clearly put in his team. That, listen, I don't care what we are, FCS, FBS, D2, D3, NAIA. It doesn't matter to me. We're Howard. That's another team. We're going to beat them. Right? So I got to give him that and for them to have the belief. But we've gone through the coaches. And the one player that I have to identify is Eaton James because the son of Edgerin, which, you know, you saw the explosiveness. You saw the talent. You saw the... Well, you know, I might have picked up a few things from my pops. You saw that, which is the reason I call him the son of Edgerin James, the former Indianapolis Colts legend, right? You see the patience. You see the timing. You see the speed. You see the vision. You see the quality running back. He had 21 carries over the weekend for 177 yards. And then he tapped on or uh, stacked on top of that three more catches for 36 yards. So in this game, he had... 24 carries for 
203 yards, like 213 yards, excuse me. This was a great game. And this is the game that you put on, on tape. We talk about the, the value of these games when it comes to facing these bigger competition uh, or the bigger schools in competition. You're going to have some film out there that people are going to be looking for because somebody's going to come looking for Northwestern and they're going to see Eden James doing what Eden James does. But overall, he just looked good, man. You're looking at a guy who they had a couple of stretch plays and he was able to see the hole. You saw the cutback and he, he almost runs like he doesn't have ankles. And that's a good thing. I mean, as a compliment. Right. Because just the way he's able to maneuver around the field and veer and cut. And it's just like, bro, it just looks so effortless, so smooth when he just runs through. I was like, man, do you have ankles? You know, if I do that, I might twist something. You know, I'm not I'm not the top tier athlete, but dang, I see a lot of top tier athletes who don't move like Eaton James. I will say that I see a lot of top tier athletes who do not move like Eaton James. And that's how he was able to total up 177 yards. He's played three games this season, this one, of course, and he has another one in which he had nine carries for 96 yards. This guy is going to be a monster. Coach G, friend of the show, you know, now at Lincoln University, that's my guy. I'm still proud. He called Jared Hunter, I think he said the most dynamic running back in HBCU football at the moment, something like that, or he, he's been the best, something of the sort. But you have Jared Hunter back there, who Coach G is somebody, when he speaks, I listen, and I value his opinion to the umpteenth degree, for real. So if you're going to speak this about Jared Hunter, and I see this about Eaton James, I'm just looking like, man, that running attack for Howard, all of the preseason hype that came into 2023, and everybody thinking what they could be, looks like they're going to be. And a part of that is because of what we just seen this weekend against Eaton James, or with Eaton James against Northwestern. Howard kept it close. Eaton James looked like a star, and I appreciate you because you're an everydayer for making this your first listen of the day every day. So everybody in this thing is great, and I'm thankful. So I appreciate you sincerely. And on tomorrow's episode, we'll be looking at the divide. I feel like Jackson State versus Alabama a and showed us a divide. And that's who is the guys and who are not the guys. It's that simple, but we'll look at it at more lengths on tomorrow's episode. In the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.